But when you try to do it in parallel with partners, that is even trickier. You don't need to hire tons of headcount to support a thriving ecosystem if you could build the ecosystem to help extend your organization. Welcome to Make Them Famous, the podcast about partner enablement. The only podcast to uncover both how partner teams enable their partners and how other department leaders enable their partner teams to achieve success. Hello and welcome back to Make Them Famous, the podcast that hopefully you agree is incredibly actionable, insightful. You hear very detailed information about a topic that we choose based on some pain points that I myself have heard on conversations with partnership leaders, as well as the service provider, the solutions partners on the other side. Now, in this episode, we want to talk about the challenges inherent to a product-led growth product when they enter the partnership conversation and start building a solution service provider partner program. Today, I had one of the most interesting discussions around a topic I don't believe is discussed enough amongst product and leadership teams early on in SaaS growth. The topic is what happens when product-led growth focused SaaS organizations launch into partnerships with service providers to support their extensive customer base or maybe break into new markets or go upstream. What does that scenario look like? Do we have a plan in place for what that looks like? These product-led growth orgs are usually just rocket ships. They're growing so fast and they have a lot of needs for service providers and service providers are coming to them with those needs, and they need support for those service providers. And the product-led strategy is almost prohibitive for inserting a service provider in that mix because it's all about automation. It's all about hands-off, no people, all product. To help us unpack this uh, dilemma, I asked Alec, head of partner marketing for Jasper.ai. Al cut his teeth in partnerships at people-driven, people-driven, people-first, people-led strategy, HubSpot, people-led, it's not an HR term, it's more we're marketing and sales focused as our growth and the opposite of product-led. Then Al went to product-led SaaS rocket ship again, Airtable. Now he's at one of the most exciting products in AI, jasper.ai. But what Al will explain in this episode is just because the product-led strategy is working so well does not mean a partner program is going to have immediate success. Product-led growth products bring inherent challenges to partnering with service providers. We're going to explain. Stay tuned. But before that, please listen to a couple of words from our sponsors, and I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Well, we could not make this podcast famous without help from our sponsors. For sponsorship, we looked to platforms that help you find, activate, enable, and manage your partner program. These tools may be the only tools that you'll need to effectively run partnership. The tools in question are Reveal for account mapping and running co-selling operations, and Partner Hub for working closely day-to-day with MSPs, managed service providers. When you're ready to really get into the revenue operation of partnerships, that means that you wanna map accounts, see what the overlap is, see who I'm targeting that you're also targeting, see who I'm targeting that you're not targeting, and come up with a strategy to get those accounts into my pipeline, into your pipeline, and to build that pie, that bigger and bigger pie together. Oftentimes you'll invite a partner to an account mapping solution that has a paywall too early, which is prohibitive for a lot of uh, the target audiences that our partner programs are after, the digital agencies. Uh, If you invite them to reveal, you can trust that they won't hit a paywall. There's 360 account mapping UI in reveal for free and it is at reveal.co. Finally, Partner Hub, again, it's a partner operations platform. Partnerships has a lot going on. Who's doing what at what stage in the partnership are the questions that many of my partner managers ask themselves. Partner Hub is here to solve for 
what are we doing with partnerships? Who's doing what? Where are our partners? And if we need to find more, are we able to go and shop for more partners? Partner Hub answers all of those questions with yes, and it is free. It's free for top tech companies like Apollo, AudioWise, Smith, Growbots, Recart, Customer.io, and it's free for digital agencies like Hawk Media, Trellis, Aptitude 8, Creative Trends. A lot of these tech companies and agencies use Partner Hub to find and align with each other. MSP, Managed Service Provider, Digital Agency, as well as SaaS tech companies. So check it out, partnerhub.app. And again, thank you for listening. I'll let you get back to the show. All right, Al, welcome to the show. Let's kick things off by giving the Wikipedia version of Al. Where are you today? Where'd you come from? Cool. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here. So I'm Al Bedricki. Uh, I've been in SaaS for just about 15 years at this point um, and predominantly in uh, partner programs and partner marketing. Uh, started my career uh, at HubSpot. Um, for nearly a decade, helping build the uh, the agency partner program, which is now called the Solutions Partner Program. Um, and then the latter half of my time there uh, was focused on helping build the app partner program. So the app marketplace of HubSpot and the, uh, the associated partners and developers involved in building the extensible products of their platform. Um, after that, <clears throat> spent some time at Airtable, a uh, low-code, no-code platform, uh, building uh, their tech partnership program to begin with and a lot of the developer programming, and then most recently rolling out a, uh, a services partner program. Um, and then <clears throat> as of now, I'm at uh, Jasper, uh, starting to kick off uh, a lot of the partner programming here uh, with um, affiliates uh, that I'm taking under my wing. Um, agency partners, uh, which is a very exciting one that we're working on, uh, supporting tech partnerships and also strategic. So quite a bit under our belt here uh, at Jasper as we get things moving in the generative AI space. All right. And um, if I say the word partnerships, I mean, where do you see partnerships as a growth lever for SaaS companies today? Anything that's changed since you started in partnerships a few years back or anything that's new for you when I when I say the, ta- the, the, the term, sorry, partnerships? I generally see, and I don't think it's changed that much, like the fundamental aspect of partners being an extension of your organization. Um, So, you know, if you have, you know, reseller partners, they're an extension of your sales team, you know, MSPs or service delivery partners, they're an extension of your CS or, you know, CSMs um, and product partners can be an extension of your product team. And, you know, one of the the reasons why, uh, you know, it's it's interesting uh, is because one, it helps uh, organizations scale. Uh, you don't need to hire tons of headcount to support a thriving ecosystem if you could build the ecosystem to help extend your organization. Um, so I've always found that a fascinating, um, a fascinating, you know, strategic moat that you can build at an organization. It takes a lot of work, um, but you know, forging those relationships, uh, figuring out the uh, partner strategies to drive that growth, um, I get excited about. And um, you know, I think that's that's remained consistent throughout my career as partners as an extension of your organization. Ah, I love that. I love that. And that backs into the conversation for today that started on the first intro call that we had when I saw your background. We were there to talk about Jasper and we'll talk a little bit about what you're doing at Jasper, but it was interesting to me going from HubSpot to Airtable. And the position that this podcast discussion is is around is when does the product itself kind of stop and humans start with relation to partnerships. And this is a discussion for all the departments of an organization, but with SaaS specifically, so much of the partnership, the partners rely on the product itself to bring. And by way of templates and killer referral onboarding processes and uh, stuff that the product team needs to have on their plate, And then, of course, the partner team needs to enable that and potentially scale that. HubSpot, very much a traditional SaaS partner program. Airtable, a little bit different. But let's talk about that. So you were at HubSpot. You kind of learned the ropes of partnerships there. Great platform, great company, great product, great partner team that you were a part of. Amazing learning experience, I'm sure. And then you go into Airtable. What were the main differences that you saw? I think what was interesting at HubSpot throughout my time there was 
how in the early days, like we had the software, uh, it was marketing software, started as marketing software. But I think what really led the movement for HubSpot, it made it very successful, was this inbound methodology of like a new way of bringing business to your website, you know, through optimization and lead nurturing and creating great content for people to be found. And I think that actually lended itself to the successful launch of the partner program before we had this like PLG motion in place, right? Like HubSpot was an idea, a methodology, and like an underlying software to support it. And at that time, I really got to understand where like the people in relationships and the ideas of building something great together, um, which is the crux of any great partnership, really came to life. Um, and I'll, I'll dig into what I mean uh, by that. Like if you take a look back at like 2011 or 2012, like over a decade ago when we were getting this off the ground, agency partners, which were our core audience at HubSpot, they were looking for a way to grow and digitize. They recognized that like the world is going online um, and they need to follow suit in order to be successful, help their clients grow and for them to be successful as well. Along comes HubSpot with this idea of inbound marketing and a playbook to justify a retainer for clients. They were stuck doing project work, that one-off website redesign, that one-off logo design, and they were really like craving, like, how do I scale and how do I grow? Long comes HubSpot with his idea of inbound marketing, this repeatable methodology that you could apply to a retainer. And they were able to successfully just sell this to agencies and agencies were wildly successful, reselling HubSpot software, getting their customers set up and then billing them on a retainer so they could go like find that next client and hire that next person and grow as an organization because they had repeatable revenue coming into the door. So we weren't a PLG uh, organization then. It was more like a people-driven idea based with like a underlying software, like partner program to begin with. So that was a really cool experience to like, just see like, here's how you build successful like relationships going to market. Like software is like, yes, it's gonna help solve the problems that you're seeing, but it's not like what you lead with. It's not getting people in the door. It's like the ideas and the um, the way of doing things that really transformed it and really got it off to the races. Fast forward to today, like HubSpot is, yeah, they are like moving into that PLG space if they're not there completely with the free CRM you could sign up for. And then you have that that's like clear upgrade path to like enterprise, right? So now they have that in place and they've kind of shifted the partner program to foot with that. And, you know, I left in 2020, so I don't have like the behind the scenes you know, happenings to understand like how that full shift happened. But yeah, now I assume that they're very much a, a PLG partner program motion at scale, which is pretty interesting. So I'll stop there before moving to Airtable, but that's that's sort of the uh, the experience I had. That's, uh, that's exactly what I, the way I articulate it to people that ask me, it's it's perfect to, to say it's almost a people-driven organization where marketing and sales kind of built what it is, product eventually I think caught up for HubSpot. I don't think the product was really that great until about five years ago. It started to get really good, but they had already gotten a thousand partners that are active. They've trained and enabled, but people-driven SaaS, call it the HubSpot example. Now you've got this new type of SaaS that started to come out about when HubSpot started to get really good on the product side. Uh, air tables of the world, the Zapiers of the world. I think Jasper, I think is in this boat as well where the product is stellar and the business case of the product is super clear. I think Airtable, yep. Zapier, Jasper, I know exactly what services I'm going to sell on those products and how I fit in and if it's right for my customers or not. And then I decide yep. I'm going to be an expert in that. And then everything else is more or less automated. So let's talk about, okay, well, going from HubSpot, people-driven, training and developing, certifying, working real closely with these agencies to show them that there is a business case here and then getting them continual certification, et cetera. Now you go into Airtable where the product is, it can be very robust if you get very close to it and there are certifications and things that are going on, but more or less, I know what I can do with it and I'm I'm a developer, I go that way. If I'm not a developer, I go this way. What um, what changed when you got into Airtable? What did you learn immediately? And then what were some of, I want to get to the final question of like the litmus test of launching into a partnership program from a fast growing 
savvy product led company like Airtable? What is that litmus test that says, let's get people involved now? Yeah. And what's interesting is like, then the, the partnership like evolution for my time at Airtable over like two years was kind of like the reverse of what it was at HubSpot because at HubSpot, I started people and then went into PLG as it caught up. Airtable's PLG and then starting to go into like this more, you know, upmarket sales driven motion. And I think, you know, when I joined Airtable, I joined with the intent of helping them build product extensibility partnerships. So they launched at Marketplace, um, helping build the developer ecosystem, um, starting to think through what strategic integrations we want to go to market with because they were at their heart up until that point, a PLG, like the product team was, you know, top heavy at that point. Right. Um, we saw, you know, inklings of, you know, where could we start expanding these partnerships into other areas as the team matured and brought on, you know, a full CS, a uh, full CS org and like a full enterprise sales team. But it was challenging because those teams were going through growing pains as they're trying to figure out how they worked alongside this PLG motion and were able to, you know, upsell customers coming through the product led side of things, sell them up onto enterprise and actually kind of mesh alongside it. And I think what I learned from that is it's challenging. Like you're trying to build a plane while flying it on the direct side to begin with by putting in like a go-to-market team alongside a PLG motion that's already in place. But when you try to do it in parallel with partners, that is even trickier uh, because again, as I mentioned at the beginning, they are an extension of your team. So any thrash or friction that is felt by the internal team trying to find their footing is magnified uh, to the exterior of the organization because any change that they make communicate to partners that are going to support you at that extension moment. Um, so that, that was probably the biggest challenge. It's like, it's hard to build these things if you don't have them uh, fully fleshed out internally, or at least have a strong point of view on what they need to be internally. I think the gist of what I got is, you know, the product led companies are going to go and use what is developed by people and create sales motions out of that. And eventually they have to go up market. It's the only way investors will be happy. And then they become more of a sales driven organization. And what happens is it's almost like you're building this sort of leaning tower of Pisa skyscraper. That is your skyrocketed sales success, but the tower is going to fall over if you don't put some people underneath that. And the people underneath yeah, yeah. that are partnerships, people, the team. So you can get yeah. into that skyrocketing situation, that rocket ship that is uh, was Airtable at the time. I think when you were there, it was a very interesting time to be there. But Airtable and the product team and the CEO and everybody's not on board with, we need support for all this. And we that means partners and not just having them develop templates and put them in the Airtable universe, but actually come and work with us to support this system, it's going to fall over. Is that correct, more or less? Yeah, I'd say so. And um, one of the challenging things too is when you are shifting from you know an entirely PLG company to one that is you know building this go-to-market engine of enterprise sales teams, it's hard to get that top-down buy-in because the sort of the institutional point of view of a lot of senior leadership has been around this PLG motion. Like Airtable started in 2013. It's been around for like a decade, right? So they think with that PLG motion in mind and, you know, when you want to introduce the concept of partnering with organizations who are going to support you on the pre-sale and post-sale side, it's really hard to understand like what that could be, what the magnitude could be and like what that priority is too. Um, so I, I found that that to be uh, you know challenging sometimes. Where you know if the you know if you're not seeing impact in the way that you want to on the direct teams being built, it's very hard to get the justification around. Hey, we should start planting the seeds for partnerships here as well and start scaling that up because at a certain point we're not going to want to hire a billion AEs and a billion CSMs. We're going to need to leverage a partner ecosystem to help us scale to the place that we need to be. And this is where the two hats of the typical partner manager kind of get worn and uh, where it becomes a conflict, I think, internally. I'm going to throw out a, a, a hypothetical and you tell me if it's accurate or not. But so a uh, fast-paced SaaS company, very product-led, going into upmarket sales motions, start to 
get a lot of requests from their customers. And there's a agency that they have that is an Airtable expert that's been helping them. Your CS team's getting bombarded and they can't help with all the needs that these new customer types or even just customers needing more because they want to do more with Airtable. There's a bunch of partnerships in that conversation, agencies, experts in Airtable, they start to need more support. So the management decide to either launch their partner program or maybe they have one partnership manager and they want to hire two and three and four. The initial objective of that partner manager is really just make sure everything is accounted for and partners have what they need. More or less another type of success team, partner success as, a, as opposed to customer success. Then you have this partnership team and the CRO is looking at salaries on a balance sheet for the partnership team. And they're like, well, the sales team's bringing in this. Isn't partnership supposed to just be generating all this revenue? Let's put some numbers on the partnership team, you know, some revenue numbers, net new revenue. And then it's like, okay, well, now your job is to go after new partners. Now it becomes, okay, well, what is new? Because everybody that really should be an air table where product is doing such a good job on the product led and marketing side of things. It's like, they already know about air table. So what is our real job here? Is it to just get a agency that wasn't already signed up for a program and just sign them up, even though they've been using air table for a while, or is it to get an agency that's working with an account to up tier that account as much as they can or all their accounts? What is our job? And then then it becomes, okay, well, now we're not supporting these agencies. We're just becoming a sales person to them. And it's less about supporting them and helping them. And now it's more about asking them for business all the time, right? So that hypothetical, I think, happens a lot or I hear about it a lot. I think the reason I talked to four different partner managers at Airtable in the last three years Maybe they were in that situation, but talk to me about kind of where that scenario may take place. What is incorrect about that scenario where you think uh, it needs a little bit of a, of a change of, of definition and what, what's relevant for you in that scenario? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So just, um, just to make sure I understand that you're saying, you know, typically in these situations, you know, it usually starts on like the the service delivery side where your, you know, your CS team can become overwhelmed. So it's great to outsource to partners. We see these businesses already in our community working with customers without any sort of programmatic motion by us. So like, let's start there to ease the burden off our CS team. Then they're starting to say like, okay, well, they're not generating revenue, right? Like these partners are just servicing our customers. Uh, so like, let's see if we can get these partners to sell for us to become a channel. Um, and then you kind of move up there, right? And then then it becomes like an evolution of, you know, what is this person's role anyways? Like these partners are selling on our behalf, they're servicing our behalf. So why do we even need people anyways to like manage this in the first place? Is that, is that sort of where you're going? Yeah, it's it's okay. It, the scenario that every partner manager hates. It's like you can't, you brought me on because there's too much for anyone else to deal. No one was dealing with this. We're yeah. dealing with it. Leave us alone. Yeah. Why are you yeah. now putting a number on my head saying now you've got to go find revenue? Like the reason why we're here is because there's tons of revenue generated through this partner ecosystem and nobody was there just to make sure that that continues, right? Yep. Yep. Changing yep. From CS. Now you're putting sales numbers, which means I'm leaning on you and maybe you have a sales background, so you're probably good at it regardless, but a lot of partner managers didn't have a sales background and now they're they're doing sales. Yeah. And I think like, to be honest, I don't think as a partner manager, you need to have like a deep understanding of sales or be a sales rep in the past, be it like a, a CS person in the past, if that's where you're supporting the program. I think you have to be savvy enough to like collaborate with those internal teams to be able to figure out the right ways that they would support the partner organization that's built as an overlay there and make sure that that is functioning correctly. But and it, it helps if you come from one of those places because then you could deeply understand it. But I don't think you need to specialize in that. I almost think of like a partner manager being like an overlay manager across the go-to-market teams where partners are going to be supported and being sort of that conduit between the direct teams and the partners that you're trying to build there. Because like, you know, if you have reseller partners, they should be leveraging the same stuff that your direct sales team is using. Um, you know, like there, no question, you have to be aligned. You have to be saying the same message, um, and you have to do it to mitigate channel conflict, uh, which inevitably comes up when you build a reseller program. Right? Um, same thing with like the post sale side. Anything a CS team is using to uh, you know support the direct customer should be leveraging that 
for the partner organization. I think it's the partner manager or the partner program manager, whoever is sort of that overlay model, to be the one to orchestrate that that happening, right? Exactly. I mean, you're you're kind of given the PC answer to this, which is what it should be. It's honestly, but it never happens that way. And no, my, no, it doesn't have all I, the negative conversations. I don't hear any positive. I don't know. Well, I, you know, I, I kind of think problems. of, you know, I kind of think of like a partner manager is like, or like people in the partnership space at an organization, sort of like a cornerback on a football team. So somebody who plays defense, if they're doing an amazing job, you never hear about them. But when they mess up, like, you're like, oh, they let that play get away. And like, oh, come on, we got to point a finger at them. So like, it's a very similar type of role where you're not going to be in the limelight if you're doing your job because you're doing your job. Nobody talks about you, right? Like, I think that's a lot of the way, like the, the, the way a partner manager operates, right? Yeah. And that's what I think surprises me about it because you put, you put any employee in a company that seems to be doing everything right. I said Zapier in the beginning. I think that's a perfect example. Airtable, I think, is right in this role. Miro, a good example, too. Um, but then you have high attrition on the partnerships team. Uh, so something's not right there, right? And yeah. there's different reasons for that at every company. But when you look at these product-led companies where it's like, I, I speak to both sides. And this is where if if you're listening for the first time, most of my conversations are with the agency service providers, these MSPs that you um, that you may want to partner with. And then I'll have one in five conversations with a SaaS company. So I kind of hear the complaints from that side. And when it's with a product led, the interesting thing that's a little bit different than your HubSpot's um, CRMs, et cetera, over there is the agency has almost everything they need to build the business on top of the solution from the product itself, right? They're getting inbound through the uh, Airtable universe or through Zapier's, um, they have a published expert, um, published Zaps that they have. And then they have the directories that are getting a lot of traffic. And a lot of people need help with these products, even though the product is so good, you get in there and it's a little bit like deer in headlights. So they go to the experts director and they get in. So the, the partners are almost, they're getting what they need, which is business out of the product, both referrals and retainer service revenue. And then a partnership team starts. And talk me through, I think, the what you saw, and this is HubSpot to Airtable is perfect. And now Airtable to Jasper, I'd put Jasper in this boat as well. Devil's advocate, what do you think breaks down when you insert a partner into a conversation where the agency is an expert in the product already. They're already got a business on top of it. Where do you think, A, you fit into that conversation? And B, why a lot of these product-led companies struggle with having a successful retained partner team for over six months or a year? Yeah, I think um, I think one of the things that uh, that's, sticks out to me, and it's something that I think it was a good um, indicator that we needed to do something here at Airtable was that there were so many people out there that were talking about Airtable services in a way that was like misaligned with our messaging. They positioned themselves as like an Airtable expert, which like at the end of the day can cause a lot of friction and confusion with your customers who might be working with them and think they're affiliated, think they might be certified. So like the fact that we hadn't programmatized anything was a risk for us because there were so many people out there that, you know, we're trying to provide value to our customers, but doing it in a very misaligned way. Right. And I think if you don't programatize at a certain point of scale, when you have like a community of businesses or, you know, potential partners that are doing this, you could run the risk of causing a lot of pain points for your customers because it's the wild west out there. And I think what we did really well at HubSpot, for instance, was create the program at a very early like like stage of the organization, get the momentum that we needed. And like you would, if you weren't part of the partner program and you were trying to like service around HubSpot outside of it, you were going to fail because the partners in this program were so well enabled, so well skilled and so well aligned with the organization and where we were going that they were going to win out 99% of the time. Right. So I think that is, you know, one of those things that like, you know, you really need to like consider. It's one of those things that like you don't think about until you start saying like, okay, what's happening outside of the organization right now if we don't do something? And that's one of those things that stuck out. 
Mm, interesting stuff. Yeah, stuff uh, I haven't heard. I haven't heard that uh, before. In all the podcasts and conversations, like that, that talk track of really what the partner may think they are versus need versus what the company thinks that person and that organization is to them and what they need out of it. Uh, very interesting. And one, one, one point two. I, I think it's pretty common actually with PLG companies because it's so easy for people to start using it and get on board and start learning it and doing it on their own and stuff like Airtable where, you know, you can get on board and build stuff and say like, Hey, I could help somebody with this. Like it's very easy to start doing that on your own as a freelancer, get listed on Upwork, right. And start offering the services. And I think same thing happened probably with Zapier where there's just a lot of experts out there until they actually programmatize something. And probably up to the organization, the brand, if they want to do something about this. But PLG usually has pretty explosive growth of a lot of users in the community. And before you know it, people are going to want to try to monetize on this. So it's it's up to you if you want to kind of get these folks aligned and all speaking from the same gospel um, or kind of just let them do their own thing and maybe, you know, be, be up against the repercussions. I love it. There's nothing more simple than just, Hey, you know, we, we have all this going on over here. It's all automated. You can join, you can start your business. And if you need a certification, you got new team members that's over here. And uh, if you need support, we've got partner teams that uh, are here to support you in the growth. That all sounds fantastic and simple. And like, let's go through some examples together. This will, this will be fun. Um, okay. okay. So successful examples of product, we call it, and I'll put this in the notes here. So if you're listening or if you're watching, look down, there's a link to this article, product-led partnership. So this is where the conversation um, I think is super interesting is uh, you have products like Databox, Pete Caputa actually founded HubSpot's partner program. Um, and on the basis of let's train these agencies to build services and that's where everybody will succeed. Uh, fast forward to Databox, they've got this really awesome uh, product-led partnerships. I call it product-led partnerships because it's where the product feature benefits funnel itself, front end and in the product, uh, leverages stuff from the partners as well as makes it super easy for the partners to bring in their clients. Airtable's example is if I'm an Airtable user, I'm going to share a base with one of my clients and we're going to work off that base. As soon as that client says, shit, I really like this and I'm getting used to it, they'll go to the agency. Would you help me set up my account? I want to use Airtable for other stuff. And I'm the service provider. And I say, sure, I'll charge you an hourly and I'll set yours up. And oh, by the way, Airtable is going to automate a commission, which is in the uh, form of a discount, I think is what I get if someone from a shared base actually joins under that email. It's all tracked. It's all automated. No paychecks or anything. It just comes out of my bill. Great. Uh, Databox allows companies like Pepperland Marketing to create templates and then they display them on a forward facing URL. And if I want to create a Google Analytics dashboard, I can search on Google. I'll probably end up at Databox because they have great SEO. I land here and I want to start using Databox with this template, get this dashboard and the product where it comes all full circle is if I onboard using this link into Databox, I start off with this template that was built by Pepperland. Pepperland potentially gets business out of this because if I run into issues, I can say, you know what, Pepperland created that. They're probably gonna be able to help me with that. And they seem like they're experts in Google Analytics. I need help with Google Analytics. I'm gonna go back to them. That's product-led partnerships. There wasn't a person involved in any of that. It all just happened. Airtables, I got a link up here, is Airtable Universe. I'm showing a PRM that we built in Airtable and it's free. And anybody that wants to use a PRM without having you know certain aspects of a PRM that you're gonna have to pay for, they can start on this platform. Uh, sorry, start on Airtable, start on our template, an Airtable base. And they see our links in the description and the how-tos and maybe they run into issues and they need help. And then they come back to us and it's a win-win for everybody. That's product-led partnerships is what I consider that. The question for you is, so Airtable had this going and then they insert partner managers into the mix bef uh, after they had this going already. Databox is in the same position. I don't think they have a partnership manager yet, 
they'll probably get there soon, but they've got this and it's working. And now partners, managers come into the fold. A, what prevents that scenario from being potentially disruptive? And B, you know, what do you think is the real success factor of adding people to this product led sort of initiative of partnerships? Yeah. So to your first question, and if we stick to the Airtable example that you have, um, that you're showing right there, I don't think Universe was designed at the beginning with the idea of scaling partner programs in mind. I think it was a very much community play. So to your point about like, hey, now adding partner managers in here, where does this mechanism fold into the partner business strategy? I I don't I don't know actually like I think it's probably a lead gen aspect as you were alluding to at the beginning um, but beyond that I don't know if there's been any sort of hey maybe we you know we orchestrate our partners to specialize in certain verticals build bases productize them in our template library or universe and then create a funnel for them I think it's an opportunity for somebody who is a potential partner or not even a partner of Airtable because anybody can kind of create and submit um, to start to get business and to share ideas um, but I don't think there was any sort of intent of like what would happen to answer your question though about like now a partner manager becomes a part of the situation and this thing already exists how do you leverage it? I think it's a, you could probably programmatically create benefits around it, right? Like you look at Airtable Universe and you think about like, hey, you know, we have a tiered partner program of gold, silver, platinum, and only platinum partners who have driven this much success get featured templates in here for lead gen opportunities because that's what they want out of this program, right? So there's probably angles like that to leverage, um, you know, productize aspects of the platform um, to drive success for your partners about things that they care about. We did something like this pretty well at HubSpot, which um, when I shifted over from the agency partner program or what they call the solutions partner program now to the app partner program, we started to notice that um, in the early days, uh, app partners were just integration partners. So Wistia, SurveyMonkey, other SaaS companies that would integrate. But eventually, as we enabled um, developers to build on top of HubSpot and build things that, would, that um, wouldn't exist if HubSpot didn't exist, it's like augmenting on top of it. We saw that a lot of our agency partners were actually becoming app partners because A, they understood the customer very well. B, they usually specialized in a vertical. And C, they had technical chops enough to actually build something. So some of our most successful app partners were also some of our most successful solution partners because they were able to successfully build apps within the marketplace and create that cross-pollination between partner programs. That is good information. I I really, I really appreciate that. So it's a situation where in Airtable's world, it was, okay, let's allow our community to publish stuff and let's scratch their back. And obviously it's in our best interest because a SEO crowdsourced. Yeah. They're going to create in a bunch of new landing pages that are pain points for our users. Shit, yeah. And then B we're going to crowdsource a whole bunch of really good ways to kind of steer our product vision maybe. Right. And there's a whole bunch of intrinsic value. And then they say, okay, well, a lot of these developers of these Airtable bases and these templates are agencies, service providers, and they're actually uh, on the administrative account for a lot of our users. You know, we see these things popping up and then no one's a stranger to partnerships in SaaS these days. It's not like, what is this? You know, oh my God. No, they know it's partners. They know what's going on. It's just a matter of time before they get there. They got there. And the litmus test for them for Airtable was what? When they said, we need a partnerships team to work with service providers. What was the litmus test there? When did they say, was it just, we've got the time now and money or is it they saw stuff keep happening? Uh, it was bandwidth uh, first and foremost, like, Hey, there, I mean, I don't know how extensive, I mean, you have a template on the Airtable universe. So I'm, I'm assuming you've uh, <laughs> been around Airtable for a little bit. So understand the, like not the complexity, but how, you know, complex spaces can become for yeah. some of the larger customers that require a lot of like, like glove, you know, assistance from somebody in the organization or a partner. Um, so we, as soon as we started building more of that go-to-market engine and we were getting more business on the, you know, mid-market to enterprise side, we realized that a lot of these customers had demands that we couldn't fulfill internally and we couldn't keep up with it. We realized on the other side in our community, we had this very vibrant, um, you know, uh, cohort of, 
service providers, consultants, agencies that were already doing this. Back to my previous point, we also pointed out the risk that they're doing it on their own way, branding themselves that kind of violate our like, you know, branding guidelines. We should do something about this, right? It's like taking this side of it and then matching it with this side of it, making something great. And I think that sort of, you know, supply demand um, uh, acknowledgement really led to the, uh, the the initial service partner program rollout. I love it. I love it. Okay. So uh, we keep kind of going into this conversation of like, the intentions are all sound, but yeah. then you get to a point where everybody's onboarded, the partner team, you've got a system in place where you're collecting everybody, you're compliant, you're making sure they're compliant with brand guidelines, they're, they're fixing stuff, you're, you're either putting them in this bucket or this bucket, segmentation's going on. And now at what point does revenue as an objective come in? So all that to me is compliance, partner success, organization, making sure that this system doesn't collapse you guys are doing a great job. When and why put a revenue number on that? And what type of conversation does that have? And how does that change things for you guys that were there to just really start out by putting the pieces together? Yeah. So I think, you know, with any SaaS business, you want to put a dollar in and get like $5 out like the SaaS machine. That's like anybody wants to create a model that looks like that. Right. So I think when we said, okay, at least immediate value There's an immediate need to get some sort of services partner motion off the ground. Great. Like now we can start getting coverage and serving these customers. The first sort of observation was they're going to retain because they're going to be happier. They're going to have their problems fixed. Um, and they are not going to cancel because, you know, a partner was able to help serve them. You need several quarters, if not a year, right. To kind of show that impact. Because retention doesn't happen tomorrow, right? It's like over months of seeing success and then, you know, potential upgrades as well for seeing success and having to go, um, you know, buy more of the product. So I think that was the first indicator we were, you know, showing up. It's like, it's going to take time. And anybody listening to this, you know, that partnerships take time. They are an extension of your team. Anything that takes your team a couple months to do, it's going to take partners a couple extra months to do that compounded, right? Um, so that that was one of the challenges that we faced. To show immediate revenue, though, because we thought that would be a good, you know, priority, and there was demand for professional services. Why not do a partner outsourced model with services where you know we would charge, we would give the partner a cut, we would take a cut for making that connection, and then looping them in with an enterprise customer who needed some white glove treatment as well. So we were getting those motions off the ground to show at least immediate revenue impact on the services side. It wasn't buying more product; it was actually just buying services. Okay, so facilitating that and just proving that partnerships facilitated that and then it's not outbound yet and then you get to that partnership maturity level of everything that you're doing continues to work so they just say and i'm saying they is like the ceo and cro and whoever else involved in those conversations say this is all working now let's give them something that they haven't done and make that the thing that we judge them on right and this is yep. where partnerships, I think, becomes a little bit of a unique animal. You don't hire a sales team and say, you're going to do customer success first, and maybe yeah. we'll get to sales in six months. Retention is your... No, you hire a salesperson and you say, go out and find new business. And if you can't, you know, we have other people that are doing it, you're going to be let go. Partnerships teams, it's like, okay, first, you're going to be success and organization and just documentation and attribution. Now it's okay. Well, now we want you to put yourself into sales motions with our current partners because we have a lot of them. Now it's like, okay, that's all happened. And we have a team that facilitates that. Now it's okay. Well, we need you to go out and become a push mechanism, a outbound yeah. sales mechanism for the partnerships. What, what do you have to say about that situation? And, you know, is that inevitable? Is there a better way? I mean, put yourself in the CEO's and CRO shoes there and what would you do differently or the same? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of assumptions that need to be debunked from something like that is one is like, hey, these, this initial cohort of service delivery partners they might not have sales chops, right? Like you can't leverage them to just move upstream and start selling if they don't have a salesperson or no sales acumen, right? It's just not going to work. You can't have them do that. You either need to vet them for that progress if they have it, or go find new partners who can support you on the sales side. Um, so that is like one thing that you just can't expect. Like, 
hey, we have partners, let's get them to sell now. It's just like asking, you know, somebody on the CSM side to be like, hey, go sell. Like, you, you can't, you can't have that ask. They just they haven't been trained to do it in that particular way and they don't have the capacity to make it happen. So in those situations, then you need to say, okay, well, first of all, is there enough demand coming in for us to justify wanting partners to help us scale our sales organization, right? Like take a look at, you know, your pipeline, what's coming in. Is there more demand than your sales team can handle? Yeah. I don't know. A lot of times like sales partners could be a net new revenue stream, but you have to do your due diligence to understand like, who is it? Are they going to be a good fit? Sometimes the larger GSIs, they need years of negotiation before they even want to entertain the idea of reselling your software. So that's going to take time, right? You can't just go to McKinsey and say, let's sell tomorrow. Um, so th there's, there's a billion factors in mind, especially when you want to move to the direct sales side about like, what's it going to take and how are you going you know, to make it happen? Okay. Okay. So talking to the CEOs and the CROs again, from a partnership standpoint, uh, the sale for us, for you, for partnerships, people isn't company that you're going to cold call and try to sell a business. A sale for a partnerships person is we've got a bunch of these records in our CRM. We don't know what they're doing. We don't know who they are. We need to get that record to be associated with more of their records, meaning they are facilitating new business for us. That's the yes. So it's you looking at the same kind of thing as a salesperson, a list of leads, and your job is to get business out of those leads. You're not selling them specifically, but you're still selling now. Yes. Yeah. And you're in an Airtable environment where Airtable has hundreds of thousands of users and hundreds, I'd say thousands of experts that they have a database of, and you've got to go down that list and get that database to generate more revenue. So how can a CEO, CRO, head of sales, whoever the partnership team rolls up under, yep. do their best job to make sure that that transition from CS to now you're selling happens smoothly, the right expectations are there, and you guys have what you need so that you're not also just pissing off a bunch of experts that were doing just fine before you entered the picture, and now you're calling them and emailing them and they're like, what, what are you doing for me? Right. So yeah. some of that's in yeah. kind of structure. Some of that's what, what is it for an air table product led? I imagine commissions yeah. are something you can use in those conversations. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think there, there's two major constituents you probably want to like dig into here. One is just like the internal sales org, right. And understand like, Hey, if we're going to either be bringing on partners that are going to be actively reselling on our behalf or going to those service partners that already exist and supporting them by tapping into their client base uh, that aren't already any type of customers and potentially selling to them. Mm -hmm. Like how do we align that with our sales team to mitigate channel conflict from day one? Like, you know, we want an overlay model. We want to make sure that commissioning for partners and how reps are commissioned works out well from a financial perspective how reps should be viewing partners in a positive light as opposed to like working against them. How do we set up a system in such a place where like, you know, partners as an extension of our team works very well with our direct sales team. So that's the first constituent. Then I think the second one is just taking a, a look at the partners that you already have. Do you need to go like with the existing service partners and see if they have databases or client like you know lists that could be a good fit for Airtable and work with them on an incentive model to say hey you're going to be partnered with AEs and we're going to like resell them and we'll give you a commission and you have probably maybe more service business out of them or do you say that's probably not going to work because these partners don't want our reps just calling and talking to their customers because they're very close to those clients. So like maybe we have to go find brand new partners that would be open to, uh, you know, reselling here. So it's, it's kind of taking a look at those two things and making the best call on what's best for the business. And then saying like, okay, you know, if partners, uh, the ones that we have are going to be good with it and we could build a model for internal sales team so that both, um, you know, both parties, partners and our direct sales team are mutually invested in growing together, then I think we have something here. But if it doesn't match in certain ways, then you have to make some trade-offs on both sides and figure out what works best. Oh, great answer. Great answer. Um, I, I heard a lot of doing, uh, doing it together and making sure you're entering that conversation with, we're going this way, you want to grow, we assume here's what we can do together to make sure that you're staying with us on this growth trajectory, right? 
Yep. Um, and there's a lot in there. And, and with the big difference, I think, m- from the partnership standpoint between an Airtable and a HubSpot is you have to kind of take the commission conversation out of that, I would assume, and unless you're talking about a big enterprise deal and there's hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe rare. It's though. icing on the cake when it's, yeah, the, the services revenue is really what, what, what matters. Yeah. Exactly. And you kind of have to enter the discussion with everything else, which is you're selling a service on top of Airtable. You're doing a great job. We want to make that better, right? Yep. By way of helping you get more customers in all these different ways and then helping you go to market with new features, bringing you closer to the product and solutions. Great stuff. So it's all, again, great intentions. I'll give you an example and we'll end with like your opinion on what CEOs and product leaders should do to anticipate partnerships being involved. This is a conversation I think should happen earlier on at SaaS. Example is Zapier. Zapier built a fantastic product. We all use it. We all love it. Partners, call them experts. Don't call them partners. Experts were working with Zapier mainly in this relationship. I've got clients. They all need Zaps. I'm going to set them up from my Zapier account. I just, instead of connecting with that HubSpot to help that automation, I just get my client's credentials. And now I create Zaps and I've got folders of clients, right? So I've got my folder for this client, this one. And in that folder, there's all the Zaps that I manage on behalf of those clients. And they pay me a retainer to create and manage those automations and do some other stuff, maybe marketing, maybe something else. Um, Now Zapier changes the way they want to approach those partnerships and they make a change to the product wherein now I can't run my business like that. Now what I have to do is tell my client to create their own Zapier account, either give me credentials or potentially add me as an admin, I log into their account and I have to break my whole client roster up. And they are calling the partners to explain this change to them. And they're using commission. We're going to pay a commission for all those that you take and break up their entire folder that you've built over years in your Zapier account and reset that up for them over there and theirs. We want to, we're going to pay you for that. And the partners got pretty upset. And now they almost have to start over with this new class or cohort of partners that understand how it's going to work and didn't even know the old way and then re kind of build from there. And I think where the team at Zapier and I haven't talked to Cody in a while about this, but I think they kind of got into a place where they were just running into walls with these partners of just like, the product and the CEO and the sale and whoever they sit under wanted them to do this. And they were having to go to partners who have done it this way for so long and just probably was ahead. I imagine it was very yeah. difficult. And just what is some of the advice that you would give? It's, it's funny CEO? you mentioned this. So hindsight's always 2020, right? Like, and I think people are going to follow the path of least resistance. And in this case, it was probably a lot easier because I imagine when they were getting that experts program off the ground, there were experts prior to the program that were doing this way. And it was the easiest way to do it because they were to my point before where people will find a way to do this. They probably signed up for their Zapier account and created individual folders, projects or whatever for each client called it a day. But when you want to scale a program that makes sense from an economic standpoint, you probably want each customer to have their own instance of that software all bundled under a partner portal or an agency like umbrella type of thing, right? I think we did this pretty well at HubSpot. And I think HubSpot actually did it because they had to, because everybody had to have their own URL because, you know, that's where you had your tracking and where you posted your blogs and all that good stuff. So you couldn't just have a partner run all your HubSpots, right? Like you had to have individual for each. It was a painful partner experience to begin with because they had to log in and log out until we built the product to support an overlying <clears throat> partner portal where you could see all your client accounts, log in, log out without having to have 20 billion tabs open. So anyway, I am solving this problem or trying to solve this problem right now at Jasper before we get our agency partner program off the ground because in my early conversations with agencies who are going to be a good fit for what I want to roll out, they are doing it that zappier way before they went through that painful migration. So I'm hoping to nip it in the bud early on to create the right infrastructure to support 
what the ideal scenario for a partner is in the next two, three, four years for how they would interact with our software and service their clients, even if it is a little clunky to begin with. Because I think clunky to begin with and showing momentum and then getting product support to build a solution that makes the most sense is much better than painting yourself into a corner and having to rip it all out from underneath. Maybe there's some advice in there for whoever you needed, but that's that's the way I would approach it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's 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 a scenario where you know your product team is killer and they're building an incredible product-led strat or have run a killer product-led strategy that's gotten the company to that point. And now there's a third party involved in the product in many ways. And then they just need to kind of shift, not shift their focus, but have that third party in mind when they're having the product discussions and deciding on key factors like, what does it take to get a new account? How flexible are we with shared accounts? You know, are we creating an environment where I can log in to Airtable and not even know if I'm the owner of that base and I've been using it for five years and now I want to maybe just delete the base and I hit delete and they're like, no, you don't own this base. Somebody else that, does. And I forget and who even started that base. And that's FreshBooks got into this situation as well, where a lot of FreshBooks resellers are the account owners and people cannot even migrate their data out of FreshBooks if they want to go to a different billing platform because their original reseller is the quote unquote owner, owner. Of the account. and it's a yeah. terrible situation. So, the- so the, the thing is, is like, you know, and it's, it's no surprise that these things happen. And I think it's fine to a certain degree that they do because you want the product team to solve the customer first, right? They're not thinking like, let's solve for the partner and then maybe solve for the customer. It's like the customer is the core of our business model. They are going to drive growth, et cetera. However, I think as you design for the customer, you could start to think with the partner in mind. And if you show incremental impact, so like say I get this program off the ground, which I'm planning in June, you know, get agencies to join and show incremental impact, there could be a little pain up front for how you need to service different client accounts. However, that is the ideal scenario for what client management is going to look like when we finally get product investment to support it from a partner experience. I would rather take a little pain up front that we can deal with rather than massive pain down the road when we do get to that point where we have to rip it all out and get a bunch of people mad at us, right? It is it is very interesting. And the more product led you go, which is what Zapier did, we're going to enable you to add as many of these connected accounts. We don't care whose user account is, as long as you have a login, you've created a scenario where you, you grow off of it and it works. Yeah. But then you sort of launch this partner program and you've got to go backwards and unbundle all that stuff. FreshBooks yeah. scenario, Airtable, kind of like that. They did the right thing in a sense, but the hardest part is now you've got to insert partnerships into that. And it's, it's it makes it hard. It makes it hard, man. Yeah. Yeah. What, what makes it sometimes what makes it very easy for the customer makes it that much incrementally harder for the partner. So you have to like think about those in parallel if you're investing in partners. The good news is, and I think HubSpot knew this and why they did what they did and, and why they, I say why they succeeded, not why they did it, but service providers today, different than 20, 10, 15 years ago is they don't want to own the account. They don't want to be responsible for all these client accounts and be the source of truth because that just creates, they're going to have to have their own customer success team. And most service providers aren't built for that. So they want you to have your own account and you to set it up. So it's good and bad in that sense. Sorry, my printer's going right now. (laughs) Uh, Anyways, excuse that, but this has been killer. I knew this was going to be a great discussion. We ended right on time. Any final (laughs) words for the CEOs, product managers? I think this podcast talks to. So if you're listening as a partner manager, send this off to your CEO and product team. But any any, uh, final words for partner managers involved in this product-led partnerships scenario or just in general? Up to you. Uh, You know, just, uh, you know, have faith in us and and, and give us time. We will show impact. But I think, um, you know, the more you can work to understand partnerships, the more successful you're going to be in supporting the initiative as opposed to just looking at it as a a thing that is at the organization, right? Um, Partnerships, again, are an extension of your team. So think about it in that lens.
Yeah, have a plan because this day and age, if you're a SaaS company that has any sort of robust feature set, like all the ones we mentioned, you're going to have to work in the partnerships channel with service providers. It's inevitable. Um, so have a plan at the very least, good or yep. whichever way you go, have a plan. Cool. Uh, Alec, Al, this has been awesome, man. You crushed it and I learned a lot and I got some notes and um, I'll get an intro done and we'll get this thing edited and printed and copied and done probably the next couple of days. So thank you so much, man. This has been awesome. You got it, Alex. Take care, man. Have a good weekend. Take care, man. Don't expect you to start sharing our solutions.